Impacts Program. My name is Amy Perry, and I'm the Adult Services Specialist with Gwinnett County Public Library. We're very excited tonight to partner with the Georgia branch of the International Dyslexia Association to offer this program that's very informative and is very important. Tonight, you are in a webinar, therefore, you will be receiving the information, but you are allowed to ask questions and they will be addressed in the latter half of the program. You can put your, pro your excuse me, you can put your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to welcome and introduce you to Renee Bernhardt, who is the president of the IDA Georgia branch. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, IDA Georgia is excited to partner with the Gwinnett County Public Library System to sponsor this presentation, and we're so glad you joined us. As a nonprofit organization, IDA Georgia is dedicated to helping individuals with dyslexia, a learning difference that affects up to 20% of the population, as well as their families and the communities that support them. Our goal is to provide essential evidence-based research information about assessment, diagnosis, resources, and appropriate educational interventions. We offer information and referral, community outreach events, professional education conferences, and teacher training opportunities to increase public awareness and remediation of dyslexia. Please visit our website where you'll find tons of great information. Go to uh, GA, dot dyslexia ida all one word dyslexia ida dot org um, and when you check out our website stop by the events page and you'll see a posting for our dyslexia dash which is coming up you can actually register right now and you can participate in our 5k virtually or you can participate in person um, so, and that's going to be uh, in the next two weeks is our Dyslexia Dash. So we're excited. It's our number one fundraising opportunity. And we're really excited to have as many people join us. You don't have to live in Georgia to join, but if you live in the Atlanta area, it's at Perimeter Mall and we sure hope to see you there. Um, other outreach events from IDA branches across the country are also listed under our events page. So please again, visit ga.dyslexiaida.org, where you're gonna find just so much information. So I'm very excited to announce our presenter this evening and introduce her a little bit to you. She just has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Jennings Miller is a former board member of IDA Georgia. She's credited for the initial implementation of our Dyslexia Dash. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't for Jennings and it's been just a, a phenomenal success and it's just so much fun. Um, she's also the 2018 recipient of the IDA Georgia Outstanding Service Award. Um, Ms. Miller is a fellow of the Orton-Gillingham Academy. She provides training to educators nationally on the Orton-Gillingham approach to reading, writing, and math. She has over 7,000 hours of experience in tutoring students in all abilities in reading and writing. And Jennings has worked at the Marcus Autism Center and the Skank School in Atlanta. She's worked as a literacy trainer for Reading is Essential for All People, otherwise known as REAP, which is a nonprofit that works to raise funds and provide training, mentorship, and practicum experiences for public school teachers. In 2021, Jennings authored the series Fat Sam and Friends, a decodable chapter book series to help inspire the love of story among uh, resistant readers, and she's also offered the Alphabet King an engaging story to teach the basic syllable types. As of July 2021, she is a fellow of record for training and instruction at Greengate at the Randolph School, an OGA accredited school in Huntsville, Alabama. And I could go on and on telling you all kinds of <laughs> inspirational things about her. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jennings Miller, our presenter, and thank you so much for being here this evening and sharing your expertise with all of us. You bet. Thanks, Renee, for having me. And to the IDA Georgia branch, I do have to say, I am not the founder of the Dyslexia Dash. That was another Jenny. That was Jennifer Hasser. I did move it to Perimeter Mall. So I, I did sort of start this latest iteration of the Dash. So I will take credit for its new, its current location. Um, but yeah, Hasser definitely started that years ago, and she's incredible for doing it. But um, 
But yes, so I'm so excited to talk to you guys tonight about dyslexia. Um, I have several of the questions that were given to me ahead of time, and um, I'm gonna try to feed them into our conversation tonight, but absolutely as we go through, if questions come up, put them into the chat box. And um, at the end, Renee will feed me any questions that I didn't address during our time together. All right, so here we go. I am going to share this with you guys. Okay, so what is dyslexia? First of all, dyslexia is neurobiological in origin. So I like to use the whiteboard because I'd like to imagine that you were standing in a room with me um, and that I was writing on a whiteboard having this conversation with you, which is why I do it this way. Um, so it's neurobiological in origin, which means it is part of your genetic and brain makeup. It's part of who you are as a learner. Um, and what's interesting about it and what's most important about it is that it is an unexpected difficulty learning to read and spell. Unexpected is the most important word in that definition, because what happens is we have otherwise typically developing children. Um, sometimes we have otherwise totally neurotypical adults, but they struggle with the reading and the spelling piece of the puzzle. And that is the unexpected part, right? So it's not due to a cognitive deficit, even though many of our students feel like it is a cognitive impairment because in a classroom, they feel less than. But it is an unexpected difficulty learning to read and spell and dealing with the language. So I'm going to give you the very, very basic version of what happens. Okay, so here in the English language, imagine a long, long time ago in a land far, far away, there were like cavemen, right? And these cavemen are talking to each other, right? They're walking around doing all kinds of things like inventing fire and the wheel. And they're like, dude, we have to write this down so other people know what we did. So while they were talking, they started to write things down. So speech actually leads to writing. And then a little while down the road, post cavemen, other people came along and they had to read this writing, right? So our language maps from speech to writing, then we read what is written. And so when we're born, we are naturally wired for speech and for language, right? So every baby out of the chute is made for speech and language. And your speech and language that you speak natively will help develop your reading circuit. And the written language that you're exposed to based on your native language will help develop your reading circuit. So we speak the English language. I'm going to speak to the English language tonight. If you speak another language, you may have a slightly different circuit. Okay. So here in the English language, right? We speak an alphabetic language. Our reading circuit develops because of that. And there's this whole very scientific process that happens in the brain where it develops a circuitry that involves your temporal lobe, your language center, and your visual center. In the language center, there's like Wernicke and Broca's area. It's a little technical. We're not going to get into it tonight. Here's the big deal. One, two, three, right? This circuitry develops based on the English language in the neurotypical brain. And so the brain undergoes this neuronal recycling. And a lot of times what happens, right, is kids who don't undergo neuronal recycling appropriately have trouble identifying letters. And they reverse things. 
like Bs and Ds. And so people begin to think that dyslexia is just backwards letters. But let's talk about why that happens. So here in the brain, there's a place where we recognize as babies, mama's face, right? This is mama's face. If she turns this way, still mama's face. If she turns this way, still mama's face. If she's looking over you at the changing table, still mama's face. As we are exposed to speech and exposed to our written language, we start to take that same part of the brain that's responsible for learning mama's face and it goes undergoes some recycling to also map letters. But here's the problem. In the dyslexic brain, sometimes this neuronal recycling doesn't happen correctly. And so although this is the letter B, but remember mama's face could be in any orientation, right? So in order for the letter B to be mapped in the brain, right, it has to be set in this direction. It always has to be B facing this direction. But the problem is kids with dyslexia still think, well, if mama's face was mama's face, then this must also be a B. But it's not, it's a D. And not only that, this is not a B. And whoop, this is not a B. Right? So one of the first red flags that we see early on in development with young children is this difficulty learning letters and reversals because the brain hasn't undergone the appropriate neuronal recycling. So is dyslexia backwards letters? No, it's not really just backwards letters. So when we ask that question, right, that's always the famous one. Is dyslexia just seeing letters backwards? No. But reversals are commonly associated with dyslexia. And it is considered a red flag because what it tells us, it's sort of like being able to do a functional MRI without actually having to go inside the brain. Because what it's telling us is that this child has not fully completed neuronal recycling to place that letter in the right orientation. And that's why he's struggling with letter ID as it relates to reversals and transpositions and movement of letters, right? Like up, down, left, right, which changes the letter, but it doesn't change mama's face. So is dyslexia just seeing letters backwards? No, but reversals are commonly associated with dyslexia, right? Other things that are real red flags for young children, right? That was a pretty famous question that was asked by lots of people. So when we think about young kids, I always tell people, to me, the way to conceptualize uh, that early dyslexic profile is to think about it this way. So remember the cavemen, right? Speech maps to writing, maps to reading. But what happens is in order for that mapping to occur, you have to be able to see and hear how, right? And our kids, our young kids with dyslexia have trouble seeing pattern. And sometimes they have trouble hearing pattern. Right? So some examples of hearing pattern that would also be red flags for a child with dyslexia would be difficulty understanding rhyme. Right? Neurotypical four-year-olds will run around the house rhyming like crazy. So a neurotypical four-year-old, you say hat, she says, she says cat. You say candy, she says dandy. You say me, she says we, right? And rhyme is just easy. 
because she is able to hear auditory patterns in language. Our kids with dyslexia, you say hat and they say hot, right? So they've matched a pattern, but they can't match the rhyme. They don't necessarily know what you mean when you say rhyme. And I could even say something like hat, pat, sat. And they might say chair, right? So they did something semantically connected, right? So they heard sat and they're like in the chair, right? Or you say sat, hat, pat, and they say pan. Because instead of giving me a word that rhymes with pat, they matched the beginning sound. But that's not what I asked for, right? Kids who struggle with rhyme have that red flag, that sign that they're not hearing pattern. Kids who struggle with sound ID or sound segmentation or sound matching, right? So I say, give me some words that start with t, right? And they just look at you and maybe they say gorilla, right? Or maybe they say pot, right? And they're just trying to match something, but they don't know how to give you a word that starts with that same sound. I could say a word like cat and say, what's the first sound in cat? And they might not be able to pull the sounds apart. They might say cat, right? So these kinds of activities are the kinds of things that we see in very young children who struggle, right? They struggle to hear a pattern. And that's why those phonemic and phonological awareness activities that you sometimes hear about in schools are such a big deal because they're a way for us to constantly be monitoring kids who are having trouble with these kinds of skill sets. Other things that happen sort of later on is they struggle to map sound symbol combinations, sound symbol relationships, because they don't see the pattern, right? So they say, we say, p, right? We say, this is the word pat. This is p, at, but they don't see those relationships on how to the letters, these shapes map onto the sounds. I love this quote from To Kill a Mockingbird, um, where Nell Harper Lee is describing Scout's um, post first interaction with Miss Caroline. And Miss Caroline is the teacher in the school, and she is beside herself because Scout has come to school as a first year a young wee little thing in the middle of no man's land, Alabama. And she knows how to read. And she got in trouble, like Scout got in trouble by the teacher because she knew how to read. And Nell Harper Lee describes Scout's feelings about this when she gets home and Scout says, I don't remember not knowing how to read. I don't remember when the letters above daddy's finger turned into words, right? And for the neurotypical reader, that's how reading develops, right? For the neurotypical child, when daddy moves his finger underneath the words, says the words, the brain starts to see and map patterns and develop circuitry and starts decomposing and recomposing, like taking apart and putting together words and making some generalizations within your brain, which is incredible. And this circuitry develops, but the dyslexic brain doesn't see the patterns. And so in the absence of just seeing the patterns, what do we do? Right? What do we do for a kid who doesn't see the pattern? What do we do for the kid who can't rhyme or struggles to break sounds apart? So if I show this word, they can't do p 
at. And then they definitely can't push it together to say pat. Or if I say hat, they can't segment, meaning to break apart the sounds and say ah. They don't see how those things map. So what do we do for them? Well, we know that structured literacy is the way to move the needle. And what is structured literacy? What in the world does that mean? Well, that means they need direct and explicit instruction in the patterns, beginning with basic sound symbol, basic, this is a B, it says B, but here's the kicker, right? Neurotypical child, you say this is a B, it says B, and that might stick. For a kid with dyslexia, you say this is a B, it says B, Three minutes later, they may not be able to tell you that. So what this means, now remember the whole circuitry thing? So the traditional, the neurotypical English reading circuit is one, two, three. These three things work together in tandem, like getting on 285 the right way, right? You get on exit 37, you head eastbound, you get off on exit 39, depending on traffic, hopefully 10 minutes later, right? The dyslexic brain doesn't have the one, two, three. The dyslexic brain lights up all over the place because they're using all kinds of compensatory measures, like all kinds of backup ways to figure out how to read. So they get on 285 at exit 37 and go westbound. And we all know here in Atlanta what happens if you get on 285 the wrong way, right? You get stuck in traffic, right? You could have a car accident. You could just give up. And that's what happens inside the brains of dyslexic children. The sounds go in, right? So they may see this word. They may even be able to say b a t. But then when it goes into what's supposed to be the letter box that then pushes these sounds together in the right order, it sometimes instead of coming out as bat, it comes out as tab. Or it just keeps coming out as b a t. b a t. b a t and never as bat, right? That's like a stalled car on 285. Like you ran out of gas because you got on the wrong direction. All of these things happen when it takes this circuitous course in your brain, right? If you go the wrong direction, if too much is happening inside your brain, there is a chance that this word doesn't come out as bat. And that's just on the single word level. So that's what's happening in the brains of our dyslexic readers, right? All of these parts of the brain are lighting up. Here's what we know, here's the good news. So remember, one, two, three, right? There's a fourth part. This part of your brain right here is what lights up when we do multi-sensory instruction. Okay, so remember one, two, three. This fourth part is connected to one, it's connected to two, it's connected to three. It's like the missing puzzle piece. So if we can give kids direct instruction, meaning we are very clear and transparent about what we're teaching. And we are super explicit. And then, so not just this is a B, it says B. But then we layer on multi 
sensory rehearsal. And we give kids lots of multisensory rehearsal. What happens is this part of the brain that lights up when we do multisensory work activates the other parts of the reading circuit. So it allows kids to learn the language as it relates to reading and writing. So what is multisensory instruction? What should that look like in a classroom? Right? So some of you guys asked, what does remediation look like? What does good intervention look like? It looks like kids writing on paper, right? Or drawing in sand um, or building letters, right? And while they're doing that, not just doing that, but simultaneously looking at a sample and tracing over it and saying the sound. So it's B, B. They trace it, they say it, they look at it, and because they're saying it, they hear it. Okay. You have to do all of those things at the same time. That's what multisensory instruction is. It means I'm doing something with my hand while I'm looking at it and I'm creating an auditory, I'm creating auditory input. So if I do B, B, you guys can't see my hand moving, but I've got an iPad down here and that's what I'm writing on. Um, so it's B, B, right? I write the letter, I look at the letter, I say the name and the sound. Eventually I might just say the sound, right? Whenever we instruct new patterns or new rules, we always instruct it directly, explicitly, and we give kids lots of opportunities for multisensory instruction and multisensory rehearsal. So when we look at words like duck or back or sick, the neurotypical brain, when they encounter these words, they start to see and hear a pattern. The neurotypical brain starts to see, oh, that CK thing, it only happens at the ends of words. It happens after I hear those short vowel sounds and it happens right next to a short vowel. But kids with a dyslexic profile don't see that and they have to be told that pattern. They have to be directly taught what a short vowel is, right? That you says, ah, uh. and when there's a k sound right after it, at the end of a short word, it's spelled C-K. And then they get lots and lots of practice tracing, saying the rule after a short vowel, at the end of a short word, you C-K. Hooray, right? And we might tag on story. We might do lots of things, but the most important part is that children should be not just talking about sound, not just looking at sound, but also physically writing and interacting with sounds and words. So multi-sensory instruction. What is good instruction, right? It's definitely direct and explicit. Great news. About 86% of the English language is rule governed. That's a huge percentage. But what that means is that for a teacher to be direct and explicit, the teacher must know the rules of the language. And that's kind of the kicker. And that's where organizations like IDA Georgia come into play for adv advocacy and to provide scholarship and those kinds of things for teachers to get trained in structured literacy. Because if the teacher doesn't know the rules of the language, she can't teach it directly and explicitly. And then they must engage in multi-sensory rehearsal. And it's gotta be a lot of rehearsal. 
our kids with dyslexia often have weak processing speed. So weak processing speed. So not only do they struggle with hearing pattern and seeing pattern, processing speed is like your hardware, okay? It's like your hardware that you're born with. So some kids are born with the MacBook Pro, right? You open that computer up and it essentially sets up itself and finds the internet, right? Some kids, many of our kids with dyslexia are born with the gateway computer from 1996 that came in the CalPrint box, right? You open it up, you have to hook it up to the modem, it goes into dial up and you get the spinning wheel of death, but you eventually get on the internet, right? These are the kids who come up to the teacher's desk and they're like, I need a, a pencil, right? They struggle with word finding. They struggle with retrieval, mad minutes, like math mad minutes, um, timed reading is nightmarish. They just don't move quickly, right? These kids have weak processing speed. They are not dumb. They are not unintelligent. Their brains just move at a slower pace. I always say it's these kids with slow processing speed that with the right encouragement and the right remediation will grow up and cure cancer or Alzheimer's because they have the kind of brains that see big picture and don't mind being slow, right? But our, our American education system is not built for these kids. So if we have a kid with weak processing speed, that's their hardware. We for real cannot do anything about their hardware. The only thing we can do is provide them with lots and lots of rehearsal and increased wait time. But here's the problem. Remember my 285 analogy? These kids are on 285 in the shoulder lane with their flashers on. And eventually what happens to these kids if they don't get good remediation is just like how we feel when we're driving in the shoulder lane on the interstate with our flashers on, what happens as the cars are zooming past? What feeling do you get, right? You feel anxious. Kids with weak processing speed who don't get good remediation and even some with good remediation begin to feel anxious in school because the American education system is built to move fast. Our early educational like elementary experience is based on speed, right? It's all about multiplication tables and being fast. It's all about those reading fluency scores. Um, and this is a nightmare for a kid with weak processing speed because no matter how much remediation they get, these kids will always be slower. And it doesn't make them less than, but it sure as heck feels like it in a classroom. And that to me is devastating. So these kids, we have to keep a close eye on. Um, and then there's one other element that could go sideways. And this is the kicker, right? So working memory. Working memory is part of the one. So remember I said one, two, three. Working memory is here. Working memory, to get to it, before we can even talk about working memory, you gotta have attention. So some of you guys asked about ADHD and dyslexia. Here's where they interplay. So if you have attention difficulties, whether that's ADHD or just like when we start to read, it's so hard. It's hard for you to sustain attention because the work is exhausting. If you've ever like done your taxes on TurboTax, like the amount of attention you have to pay to every stinking page, what happens, right? Eventually your brain fries and you can no longer sustain attention because the task is so hard. That's what it feels like for kids with decoding deficits, like difficulty reading, 
when school is all about reading, right? So attention can be a problem. But then there's also, so after we get through attention, if attention's working, awesome. Then we have this dude called executive function. Executive function is like the CEO of your brain. He is organization station. He is in charge of retrieval. He is in charge of organizing the filing system in your brain and calling it forth when you need it, right? Executive function is the dude that cues working memory. Working memory isn't like short-term memory. Short-term memory is mama says, get your shoes, get your book bag, get in the car, right? Kid says, shoes, book bag, car, right? That's short-term memory. That's like parroting, right? Working memory is kid actually has to do the work of getting the shoes, get the book pack, and get in the car, right? And we all know what happens with our kids with poor executive function and poor working memory. They go to get their shoes, they see their pet fish bread, they wish that they had fed him, they're tapping on the glass, saying goodbye to bread, I'll miss you all day. And it's 10 minutes later and mom's like, where are your shoes? Where is your book bag? We're all in the car and ready to go, right? They couldn't do the work because executive function fell asleep and forgot what they were supposed to be doing. Organization station failed, right? Working memory also has capacity issues. So even if attention is okay, even if executive function is doing the very best job he can, working memory has a capacity, right? I was one of those humans that came out of the shoot, like born with a giant working memory, like one of those cereal bowl style, like, like cartoon cereal bowls for working memory. You could pour as much information in and guess what's going to happen? It's going to stick, right? Problem is, many of our kids with dyslexia are born with the Martinelli apple juice bottle, like that teeny tiny apple shaped bottle that has the tiny little opening in the top, right? And so when we think about school, you can only pour in just a little bit of new content and then kids need lots of rehearsal in order to file it correctly and move it into the right system in the brain for retrieval later. The problem is the American academic system we take content and we just keep pouring like we can't stop pouring new content into kids brains and because of that our kids who have a small capacity for working memory they really struggle to retrieve information right these are the kids who knew their three times tables when they left the house that morning and then they get to school and they don't know them anymore it's the kid who knew how to spell the word was. And then three weeks later, it's gone. Like it was never even there. They look at you like you had three heads. Like, what do you mean the word was? W-U-S. Like, not W-U-S, right? The other piece that everybody, I like to tell everybody about this little trio of folks inside your brain, executive function is really not even on board until about age eight. This is a problem because we are asking very young children in K-1-2 to juggle multiple steps of information without providing them enough rehearsal. And when we look at the child with dyslexia, many of our kids are delayed in the domain of executive function and theirs isn't even on the table until age 10. Executive function continues to develop, especially in males, until about age 25, right? So when we think about this working memory deficit, when we think about attentional issues, and then we put into play that executive function isn't even ready to do his job until age eight to 10. And we think about how much of our reading education happens prior to that and how fast we're moving in classrooms, 
well, it's no wonder that our kids with the dyslexic profile really, really struggle. So all this to say, there are lots of things that create dyslexia. Dyslexia is not just reading backwards, right? Dyslexia is not a cognitive impairment. It doesn't mean you're dumb. It means your brain is literally wired differently. What we know is that the best thing to do is do not wait. Don't let anybody ever tell you, well, let's just see if Johnny's going to grow out of it. No, ma'am. Do not wait. Early intervention works. Kids who are reading below grade level at the end of first grade, unless they receive structured literacy interventions, may be struggling readers for the rest of their lives. Let that sink in. That's the correlation. The end of first grade. Don't let anybody tell you to wait. Don't let anybody to tell you maybe they're just developmentally delayed, even if they are they need early intervention. All the research says now, if you can intervene like in age five, six, seven, you can actually help create a reading circuit. So children who receive early intervention between the ages of five and seven, like high quality, Orton Gillingham based structured intervention from a knowledgeable provider, they can create a neurotypical like reading circuit. These kids by fourth grade may read or look like they're reading like typical readers, right? Early intervention works. Intervention must be spelling and reading together. Let me tell you why. Remember the cavemen? Speech does not lead to reading. Not only that, this is one of my very favorite quotes from Sylvia Richardson. He was sort of a big deal. She says, if you teach a child to read, there's no guarantee he will ever learn to spell. If you teach a child to spell, he will learn to read. Holy smokes. So if somebody tells you just read more to Johnny, that's also a fib. That's not going to help Johnny. Reading more to him will not make it better. If you're a parent and someone has told you, well, maybe you just didn't read enough to Johnny, that's a fib. It's not your fault. Johnny was born with a different kind of brain and Johnny needs a different kind of instruction. He needs the kind of instruction that puts spelling and reading together. And no matter the child's age, whether you're a wee thing or a middle schooler or a high schooler or an adult, the right intervention is Orton Gillingham based, multi sensory, structured, explicit, direct instruction. But here's the thing nobody wants to tell you it's not fast. Nothing is going to happen in 12 weeks of RTI. I can't, I mean, I do this every day. I see children in private practice, I run 40, 40 sessions a week with kids, I train teachers, but my heart is in working one-on-one -on -one with kids. It's not fast. It usually takes at least 100 sessions to start to see big gains, to start to really genuinely close the gap. We need at least 100 sessions. The gold standard says twice weekly, 40 to 60 minutes, one-on-one. -on -one. That's not realistic. I'm just going to tell you that's not realistic. So if you can't get twice weekly, 40 to 60 
minutes a week one on one with a qualified provider. That's the other caveat, right? Because if teacher doesn't know how to directly and explicitly teach, then she can't help, which is problematic. Um, the next best thing is to get small group instruction for 30 to, sorry, 30 to 60 minutes, four to five times per week. That's not 30. 30 to 60 minutes, four to five times per week. So see what happens is as we increase the group size, we also have to increase the frequency, right? Because kids need lots of multi-sensory rehearsal. And as you increase the group, each child gets less rehearsal. So you have to increase the frequency. But y'all, I, I mean, the only thing I can tell you and the thing that can move the needle is you have to have a qualified, knowledgeable, knowledgeable provider. She has to know the language. She has to know the rules that govern the bulk of the language. And she has to know how to teach them to young readers. And she has to know how to do that with spelling and with reading. And so those are the big pieces of the puzzle. And no matter how old you are, no matter what it is, that's what you need. I always say, you know, the, the diagnosis may be medical, right? Dyslexia is a medical diagnosis. I can't do it. It's got to be delivered by a doctor, someone with PhD behind their, um, behind their name or PsyD behind their name. It can't be delivered by an educator. Um, but it's a medical diagnosis, but the treatment is educational, right? So no matter the diagnosis, no matter if you have one or not, if you suspect a delay in reading or spelling development, or you're seeing some of these red flags, these difficulties with spelling, uh, persistent trouble remembering the alphabet, trouble singing the alphabet song, trouble rhyming, trouble with sound symbol. In our older students, it looks like difficulty answering written expression questions, right? Um, persistent trouble with irregular past tense, right? So I goed to grandma's house instead of I went to grandma's house. Um, I run to the store instead of I ran to the store. They struggle with that because again, remember hearing pattern, right? Um, So these are the things that are the flags, but regardless of the flags, the treatment is structured literacy. Ideally for older students, the older the student is, the more prescriptive and the more knowledgeable your provider has to be, right? Young kids just need really good phonics-based instruction. Right, that includes elements of phonemic and phonological awareness. As kids get older and the gap gets wider, or we're talking about adults who still struggle to read and write, you need someone who is incredibly knowledgeable about the language. All right, so Renee, I've seen lots of questions come in. Now let you come back, let me know what I missed, and I'll see what I can answer. Sure, and um, this is a reminder, some of the questions did come through uh, before tonight, so I'm gonna, um, through uh, the registration process. So uh, there were a couple that I think maybe we can go back and touch on. And I'm also gonna help maybe answer some of the questions. Um, I, I know I didn't get to say it in the beginning, some of my experiences as a public school administrator and especially in special ed. So if there are questions about the public school, um, that if Jennings can't answer, I'm certainly gonna try to jump in and help as yeah. well. Fantastic. All right. So one, the first question. Um, so um, some of the suggestions that you might have for teenagers who have dyslexia and are really feeling some of the mental health effects of it. 
Yeah, I think what's super important is to remind kids that they do not have a cognitive impairment, that they are incredibly intelligent and gifted. And I think one of the very best things that we can do and what I often try to do with my older clients is really find the ways in which they shine, really start to bring out the things that they're talented in. One of my older students was at a small private school that didn't have sports. And he was actually an incredible athlete. And so whenever we transferred him into a high school, we were really looking for a high school that had a strong athletic program. And he was able to really like be a leader in athletics. And it totally changed his opinion of himself and, and the way he viewed himself. But I think it's so important that we find their gifts and really play those up. Yes, perfect. One that just came in. Um, what's the relationship between dyslexia and dysgraphia? Sure. So dyslexia is difficulty with the language, which could be anything reading and writing related. Dysgraphia is specifically to do with getting the information on the page. So some kids with dysgraphia early on will really struggle with letter formation. But then later, let's say this is the line their letters may float above or below. They may have trouble keeping words stuck together, right? So the word bad isn't stuck together. There's a space inside the word bad and maybe that D gets stuck to the next word, right? Um, later on, dysgraphia really rears its ugly head with difficulty with written expression, like long lengthy writing activities, being able to craft creatively and get what's in their head coherently onto the page. It's like there's a disconnect between the tip of the pencil and what's happening inside their brain in the thought process. I hope that was a, a decent explanation. Yeah, and they don't always occur together. I know that was one of the questions. Do they always go hand in hand? They don't have to. In fact, we do have a lot. I have a lot of kids in my practice who perhaps their dyslexia is relatively mild, but their dysgraphia is incredibly severe, um, which isn't uncommon. And we can really remediate the reading piece of it and the spelling piece of it, but the written expression, like getting stuff on the page may, may forever be really tricky. So this question, I think you um, kind of really touched base on this, but I want to maybe we can just elaborate more specifically. This person has an eighth grader who um, is reading at a first grade level um, and the student was getting instruction or is getting instruction through Wilson, um, the Wilson reading system mm -hmm. and not having success. And, you know, I personally having um, certification in Wilson, my opinion would be how well um, is this, this is a certified delivered. Wilson instructor? Have you gotten in touch with Wilson to verify their certification, which you can do? Um, or is it someone who just says they have the training and then maybe how much the intensity, because you talked about the intensity of intervention and really needing to make sure you, you, know, you meet that intensity requirement. And if you wanna elaborate on that a little. Yeah, I think that intensity is huge. You know. Um, and fidelity, like treatment fidelity. You know, Barbara Wilson is very, very serious about what she wants in that lesson. And it's very clear about the timing that it takes to deliver a true Wilson lesson. And oftentimes what I see happen um, in schools where teachers aren't fully trained is they're doing, I call it the guacamole taco approach to Wilson's, you know, like you go to Moe's and you can just get a taco, but you need to put some protein in it. And like there are elements, there are essential elements of a Wilson lesson that will help move the needle. But if the teacher's only grabbing guacamole and salsa, you might not ever move the needle. It's not that she's not doing elements of the lesson, it's that she's just not doing it to the fidelity that Barbara Wilson envisioned when she um, designed the program. Okay, um, and this one, I'm. I don't know how well you feel about addressing it. What's the public school role in helping parents determine um, if the child has dyslexia or what their issue might be? So it's not their job. Their job is, I mean, you can speak to this too, but my understanding, it's not their job. Their job is to determine eligibility for services 
And, um, and honestly, unless they have an and here in Decatur, we recently hired um, some psychologists to be on our testing board. And so now they do have the ability to diagnose if they wanted to. But oftentimes testing is designed from a federal bird's eye view to determine if Renee qualifies for services under federal law. It's not to diagnose Renee and it's not to give you a full profile of who Renee even is as a human. It's really just to help us identify, does this child meet the criteria for needing specialized individualized services um, to meet her unique needs and circumstances? And unfortunately, that's not the same as really helping you peel back the layers of the onion that may be your child. Yeah, and, and that's a really tough one. I, I agree because um, dyslexia falls under specific learning disability. So dyslexia in and of itself isn't, it's not the reason to right. receive extra services. And then sometimes, um, you know, public schools, there's really a limit to what they can, what they're able, the, the type of instruction that they're able to deliver based on a lot of different factors. Um, and not that they don't want to, but not that, that they don't one, want to. One, no. yeah. I mean, teachers yeah. want to, teachers want to do best by your kids, but it is really, really hard. And if I always say to my families that I work with privately, I always say, listen, here's the deal. If you start working with me and you don't have an IEP yet, you might not ever get one because I'm going to move your kid. And the way you get an IEP, unfortunately, in the Americanized education system, we are a failure based system. Yep. And that's not that's not like Cherokee County. That's not DeKalb County. That's not the state of Georgia. That is America. We are a failure based system, which means you get services if you're failing. Um, which is heartbreaking because then it's like, well, what do I do? Do I not get my kids services so that they'll fail enough to get services through the school district? But, but then like Renee said, there's no guarantee that once you get the services that you have teachers in the building, they may own the Wilson box, but it doesn't mean they've been trained to deliver it or to know what the rules of the language are. Yeah, and I and that's really one of the biggest missions of IDA. We're we're really trying to help teachers get the training. I personally, as an educator, paid a lot of money to get a master's in literacy and never even heard the word dyslexia, which I was like, how is that even possible? And sure enough, my first class of students in high school were dyslexic and I didn't know how to help them. And I thought, that's a travesty. How is that possible that I could pay all this money to get a great education and I don't know how to help dyslexic kids? I did find out, I did a lot of work on my own and like so many teachers do. And there are great schools that are providing that teacher training. So it's not, you know, it's not a one size fits all problem and there aren't one size fits all solutions. But that's one of the things we really try to help with is that teacher training and getting teachers the resources that they need and school administrators. And there are just so many people that are on board with that. So great answer, thank you. Um, just, just two more questions, I think. Um, and if any other ones come up, I'll grab those really quickly. Um, so how would you know if you're an adult and you think you have dyslexia, but you're, you're really not sure, what are some things that might help you determine if you have you dyslexia? You do. If you think you have dyslexia, <laughs> I would probably bet my left shoe that you do. Um, one thing that I always say is like, do you really love to read? And if you do really love to read, do you still find it like exhausting? Like does reading a novel kind of tax your brain, right? Um, my my father-in-law only reads the newspaper, right? He never reads a book. I'm fairly certain he's dyslexic. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I can see it, right? Those consistent things like um, you really have to think about spelling. You're constantly like the, the iPhone was the best thing that ever happened to you for spelling because you can just type it in the text box and it'll tell you if you've spelled correctly. Those kinds of things like worrying about your spelling, being tired when you read, um, being a slower reader and just being a slower reader doesn't make you dyslexic, but if you're slow and it's tiring, it means that your brain is really compensating to help you read. Makes perfect sense. 
All right. Um, so this question came in, and I'm not sure if I'm wording it correctly, but um, so are the pattern problems that dyslexics experience? So you talked about the patterns, is mm -hmm. issues with patterns, especially with was related to um, like rhyming, uh, onset and rhyme. Um, are those kind of pattern difficulties extended to other types of patterns or symbols that they might see, like you know, like traffic sign symbols and other kind of symbol imagery? Yeah, and we do see that. It typically um, tends to be more letter-based symbol Im imagery or more abstract symbols, right? So like a yield sign or things like that, that they have trouble kind of mapping. We see it in math all the time. Like the difficulty with, I, they misidentify the addition and the multiplication symbol or the division sign and the subtraction sign. They're constantly mixing them up. Um, they'll do a whole page of math, the wrong operation. You're like, how did you do that? Um, we see it too in like the reading of little words, like prepositions are really hard on my kids. They trade out of for for and for for from, and they swap out all the articles and they miss suffix s, or they just add it to everything. They, they seem to be equal opportunity. Um, but they definitely struggle with those kinds of things. Geometry is a night mayor, right? Mapping those shapes in the brain. They really struggle with directionality. Like I have, my brother-in-law always says driver side left, like driver side turn or a passenger side turn. He doesn't know right and left as an adult. And it's, I mean, it's persistent. Wow. Um, could, could, so someone's asking if you could have dyslexia in adult in adulthood um, or, you know, if it could just start later in life? It, it doesn't typically start later in life because you are born with it. Um, the one thing we do see is, um, you know, sometimes we have just, we associate some of those issues. If, if you have a stroke or like an ischemic event, we can see disruptions to a reading circuit or any kind of traumatic brain in, injury could cause disruption to the reading circuit, just like it could cause disruption to your language center right, like aphasia or things like that, that can cause um, disruption to anything in the brain. Because it is, a, it's a, it's a very sophisticated circuit. So any kind of, um, any kind of brain injury or any kind of a, like event, like a, like a stroke, like event could definitely negatively impact your reading circuit. Great answers. Uh, well, you've gotten lots of compliments to the chat. Well, we're really impressed with your presentation. Um, someone asked if there was going to be a handout for teachers or if there's um, some information that could be shared with teachers specifically in writing. I would recommend if you go to the Georgia IDA website, we have, if you go under um, the professionals tab or the educators tab, um, we have a resource called Dyslexia in the Classroom, What Every Teacher Needs to Know, and that's a really great, just a few page document, has a lot of great research-based information. That's one of the things I would recommend. Uh, again, on our website, we really try to provide a lot of different resources. Was there anything specific that you would recommend, Jennings, as well? Yeah, I was oh, going to show them there. here where you can see it. So if you go here you can see like parents you can see dyslexia is a definition there are loads and loads and loads of fact sheets so there's dyslexia basics talks about emotional issues i mean honestly everything you could possibly want we have a fact sheet for and really ida is an incredible resource it was designed and created for advocacy and education and that is what the heart of the organization is um, I cannot tell you how much we would appreciate you registering for the DASH. All of those dollars go towards advocacy and education and training teachers, which is the one way to move the needle, um, especially in these rural districts in our state. I just got back from Warner Robins and training five counties in middle Georgia um, two weeks ago, and, and those teachers need this training and they want this kind of training. So register for the DASH. Yeah, Even and I don't, I, I don't run. run. <laughs> I'm wearing my dash shirt from. A, um, look at that dash, dude. <laughs> not this year, not this past year, but the year before, because it's long sleeved, and we're going back to the long sleeve shirt. I have to tell you, it is the softest, most comfortable. Everyone loves these shirts, so it's like just half the reason to participate. If you don't want to run a 5K, you don't have to. Um, if you if you come in person, we have other. Um, 
resources. We have lots of people who are there sponsoring who will give you great information about um, local resources. And if you do the virtual, you also get a lot of great information and you can get the shirt sent to you. It will be sent to you. So all the reasons to do it. If, if you don't want to run, you definitely don't have to. I don't run, but it's a great, <laughs> it's a great, great event. And I highly, highly recommend it, especially if you're feeling after listening to this talk, like how do I help get teachers trained this is how you do it. IDA Georgia is, is one of the best branches that really offers scholarship and thoughtful opportunities for training around our state. Yeah, thank you so much again. We really appreciate everyone who joined us this evening. Um, as a reminder, you will receive an email within 24 hours um, with the information in regards to receiving your certificate of attendance for participating this evening. So if, you do, if it doesn't come directly to the email that you provided when you registered, check your junk mailbox because once in a while they sneak into there and they shouldn't be in there, but it's always a good idea to check that. Um, and you can also um, send us a little email. If uh, you can go to the IDA website, um, the IDA the Georgia .ga .dyslexia org, and you'll see our contact information there as well. And you can always email us if you don't get it, but we have everyone's name, so you'll get it. Uh, we've done this a few times. We've, I think we've got all the bugs ironed out and shouldn't be a problem. Um, so just make sure you check your junk email if you don't receive that information on how to get your certificate of attendance um, within 24 hours. I think that's everything. Can you think of anything else? I can't think of anything else. If you, um, you can always reach out to me. Um, if you Google my name, Jennings Miller, you will find me on the interweb. And that's the name of my website as well, JenningsMiller.com. Always happy to answer questions. Um, but IDA Georgia, Anne Marie, who will answer your email. If you, if you email info at IDAGA.org, she will respond. And she's so incredibly knowledgeable about all the services available in our state. Oh yeah, lots. She she knows everything yeah. as well. So we're really glad again that you joined us. Thank you so much, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. All right. Good night, all.